Welcome to Strong Point Boots. We're at uh, Leylong Common, St. One, on the far northwest corner of Jersey. Behind me, you can see the very impressive MP3 Tower, one of three built in Jersey. There was actually nine of these designed, but in the event, only three were actually built. Now, right now, we're going to move on to another part of the common, uh, which supports this tower. To defend the MP3 tower, which you see behind me, uh, we have this FL242 anti-aircraft bunker. We excavated this bunker in 2016. Um, it was buried right up to the top of the lintel here, um, and we did it all by hand. We excavated 20 tonnes of uh, ground and uh, inert rubble from the entrance and we exposed these uh, entrances and the stairways to go into the bunker. Okay, into the 242 bunker. Above our heads is two metres thick reinforced concrete. Turn to our right. This area was meant to be a decontamination zone. It should have been fitted out with water. But in the event, this bunker never was. Um, for what reason, we don't know. Probably because there was no water here up at Leyland. But it, it's a standard type of bunker, so it would have been fitted out for such. So there should have been a shower in this corner. We've got the remains of some racking here. And this is where Germans would have put their ready helmets on the top, or spare ammunition cases as well for their guns. Um, but what's really quite something about this bunker is the artwork on the wall, which is the reason why the Occupation Society actually chose to excavate this bunker. So look here, we've got flowers actually painted onto the wall, onto a base coat of magnolia paint. And if we go into this room now, this is where the shells for the anti-aircraft gun were kept. So now we're in the ammunition room for the two centimetre gun that was mounted on the roof. Um, excuse the mess in this room a little bit, this is where we uh, keep some of the tools and things for when we're renovating the bunker. And here you can see the remains of the original wiring that was in situ. If you had come into this room straight off the liberation, you would have found this room completely stacked high of ammunition, right up almost to the ceiling. So we go straight into the gas lock room. Um, it was equipped with a uh, gas filtration equipment. Um, but what's really striking about this room is the artwork that's in here. Just look at it. This is all original. It's quite something to see it all decorated like this. Again, with the magnolia paint behind, and the, it looks like oil paint being used. It looks like poppies. Right, so this recess here was actually for a sink, quite equipped as well on this little gas lock. And to the right is the place where the electricity came in and telecommunications. You can still see the remains of the cable on the floor here. So into the personnel room. Um, if you look up on the ceiling, you can see where the bunks were, the chains were suspended down, and these fold-away bunks would have folded up against the wall, but the brackets are, are now gone, they've been taken by the scrap men. Uh, so we had three, six, nine bunks in here, so nine personnel could have stayed in the personnel room. And then we have this bespoke wall, all in brick, you notice. Um, it's a standard feature, because I've seen this bunker in Norway as well and it was done after the main cast of the concrete. In that little room in there would have been the officer's room, the NCO's room. Again, uh, equipped for three bunks. Right, so have you noticed, um, we've only got one entrance coming into this bunker. So had that entrance actually been blown in by a shell coming in and the personnel couldn't get out, then there's this escape shaft being put in. And you see those slats that are in there, they would have been for metal bars. So that was being, so in case there was a, a grenade that was actually tossed in down the, sh the chute, um, they would be given some protection. So the idea was they actually take the metal bars out and go out through the escape shaft. Now, there's this little hole here that's been put in, there's a bit of an adaption. <laughs> um, they must have had a very smoky stove because that hole up there was been for the stove. It couldn't have ventilated very well, so what they, they had done is actually punched a hole through the side to let the foul air fumes out, which is quite interesting to see. I don't often see that. 
So that's where the stove would have gone. And this is where the air pump, the air filtration pump, the gas lock would have gone. Um, up here, you still see the remains of the wiring. It's all here. And this is the intake and outlet for the gas lock. And some remains of the original wooden lining there. But that, this room would have been wooden lined as well. Right, up the stairs from the depths of the underground bunker. And look at these steps. They're slightly wider than normal. This is to allow an ammunition crate to be brought up by two men, ready for the gun. All right, and here we are onto the operating platform for the two centimeter Olicon uh, 29, which was a Swiss made gun. And it was capable of firing 170 to 180 rounds per minute. When you look around this emplacement, you'll see some of these am ready ammunition niches put into the emplacement all the way around. One of these recesses is quite different. It was actually to provide local defence for the gun emplacement. A soldier would come in here and would be able to stick his K98 rifle out of here to provide defence. So this is M2. Um, this is one of 10 um, army observation posts that are still in situ around the island today. And they were just a temporary emplacement uh, while the observation towers were being built. They're actually manned by the army as opposed to the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, who manned the tower. Before we go into the MP3 tower, I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about the bunkers that you see in the distance behind me. The first bunker is an FL242 bunker, very similar to the one that we've just been into, which had the two centimetre anti-aircraft guns mounted on top. And the box type structure you see in the background was for an early air defence radar. Right, so here we have this massive bunker right next to the MP3 tower. Now, just look at the size of this thing. It was actually under two metres thick reinforced concrete and it was actually for a generator set for the radar on top of the tower, a personnel room and a plotting room for the radar. Also, local defence was this heavy machine gun position. Now anybody trying to get into this bunker to capture it would have to run up against that. Now that machine gun in there would have been capable of firing anything up to a thousand rounds per minute. So I think it's good bite Vienna to anybody trying to get in. This whole area was covered with camouflage netting. When you look around, you can see where the Germans made a big use of the natural camouflage of the area by utilising the original granite which they carved out of the area. Um, look to here to your right, you see the cast of the uh, concrete that was for the tower. And then a little bit further along, you see uh, a the intake for the ventilation system, which was for a gas lock, which is slightly inside the tower. Just to the bottom of there is an entrance defence for a heavy machine gun, which would have defended the entrance from uh, any commando attack from an assault from the cliffs. Here, just to your right of the entrance defence, you can see the different stages of the concrete pour for the construction of the tower. So you see a line at the bottom, that's the first day's work, there's the second day's work, a third day's work, and so on as you go up the tower. Right, coming into the bunker. Look above us here, you can see where metal would have been originally placed. Um, and that is all f part former of the bunker. But all this has rusted away in the past 70 years in a very exposed position like this. The sea waters, sea air has just corroded everything. But this whole area is built like, in like a jigsaw puzzle and it had numbers on the plating to tell the construction engineers where to put things. So the metal's fallen away, but the paint has transposed itself in reverse onto the concrete. This area here, we have a recess for a radio mast that would have gone up and it would have been wound up, cranked up, to a height of about 30 feet. Um, and that was to keep in communication with the other important installations around the island and to transmit vital data uh, to what's happening out on the sea between here and Guernsey. So there's actually two recesses, one there and one this side. Okay. So. 
this area here, the scrap metal merchants came here in 1953 and removed all the heavy metal fittings. And here was known as a stable door. There's two separate doors. And they'd literally been cut off. So that's all we see today. And into the second floor of the observation tower. And here is where all the electrics come in from the generator bunker, which we've just been outside to see, and those holes outside the tower come out here. So this is all the cabling, the power cable from the generator bunker, and it was literally brought here as an afterthought, and it was punched through into the ceiling and right up to the top floor, some 14 metres above us. Okay, and down here is where the other electric cables would have come in to service the electrics for the whole bunker. You can see the traces where it would have come in and come in here. So it would have been a big junction box here and to distribute the power to the whole tower. Okay, into the second floor of the observation tower. Uh, each level was heated and worked independently to the next one. Um, so a, a heater would have been put in this corner here. We don't think there was any wooden lining at all um, because early part of 1943 I think materials were beginning to run out so this tower was never actually fully finished off. However, it was equipped for range finding as we know. Um, looking at the floor here, you can see there would have been a place for a tripod for a range finder of sorts. Originally, it would have had windows here and the windows would have been folded open. Fantastic view that you see from here. You just see the Commodore Clipper coming in on another supply trip to the islands. Okay, so remember I told you that we came in onto the second floor. Before going up, we're gonna go down. Okay, so now we're right down into the basement. And again, this is the best preserved part of the whole tower actually. Here you can see some original pencil mark. There's this thing here called LG. That's a lighting gerat. So here would have been for a light switch. And then into this part here, this is where stores and spare parts for the radar was kept. Again, whitewash all around. And then here we can see some original pencil marks here as well for ger this is German. What this is a writing measurement calculation for, I don't know. Okay, so now we're up on the third floor. Pretty much like you saw on the second floor, each floor is very, very similar, but there are some subtle differences that I'll point out to you now. So, on this floor we've got some brackets that actually stick out off from the uh, wall, and this was for the range finding equipment. Um, and here we have a grenade chute. Now, these are quite interesting because if you're looking right down there, you can look down there, you can see the chute going straight out. So you could, the observers, if they were being under attack, they could actually chuck a stick grenade down. Hopefully it would explode outside. So now we're up onto the fourth floor. And this floor is a little bit different in that it offers protection for the rear of the tower through this heavy machine gun position. And another one of our grenade chutes here to the right hand side. Okay, so now we're on the fifth floor, top of the shop. A um, little bit of graffiti here on this level, uh, dating from the 60s and the 70s. And here you have the entrance to the top floor, a shaft that would have made your way up to the radar. So in this level, top of the floor, we've got the best views. And looking across to our left, you can see La Corbiere in the, in the background. The observation positions were here to observe anything out there out to sea and communicate that to the headquarters. Guernsey had the longest range guns, battery Mirus. Uh, that had a range of some 40 kilometers. So it could actually touch the beach here at St. Wands. Um, but there were lesser power guns here in Jersey, but they were capable of controlling the traffic from Guernsey to Jersey, making sure that the uh, cargo ships and merchant shipping of their uh, German merchant shipping were protected. So we're at the end of this particular virtual tour. Um, 
Before I go though, I'd like to just show you something that you shouldn't see for yourself at the bottom of the cliffs. It's much better from this vantage position. At the end of the war, there was tons and tons of ammunition, ordnance all around, and of course the heavy guns. And in February, March 1946, they're all brought up here and literally just thrown over the cliffs. If you come to this point and just look literally down there, you can see the guns on a low tide. Not all of them are still there. The Occupation Society between 1979 and 1993 recovered seven of them. I hope you've enjoyed this virtual tour and one day you'll come and see the fortifications in person. <laughs>